بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another episode of 14 Divine Guides We are in the second episode of looking at the life of Imam al Hussein. Peace and salutations be upon him And I am delighted to be joined once again by His Eminence Sayyid Muhammad Baqir Al-Qizwini On behalf of the viewers I welcome him Assalamu alaikum Sayyidna Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah Thank you, Sayyidina, for joining us once again on the, this special episode looking at the life of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Today's topic, inshallah, we will try and look at the journey uh, of Imam al Hussein um, to Karbala. Uh, and I feel it's only um, right to start this, maybe, this journey by looking at the rise of the Umayyads um, and trying to look at a brief detail um, of the rule of Muawiyah. Um, and how he tried uh, to manipulate people's minds against Imam Ali alayhi salam um, even as much as when people heard Imam Ali was uh, struck while in prayer they were shocked that Imam Ali prayed uh, so there was a lot of uh, conniving done by Muawiyah uh, during that time and uh, around Rajab uh, 68 H um, Muawiyah died and he tried to pass the reign to Yazid. If we can try and have in, in summary uh, a brief look at the rule of Muawiyah and the rise of the Umayyads. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The society in Sham was an interesting society. The religion of Islam hadn't really settled with them. There were still Roman influences on Sham. It was a decadent society quite corrupt. Uh, it was a society that didn't really uphold moral and ethical values. Now Muawiyah ruled in Sham for quite a long time. Remember that Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second Khalifa, appointed him as the governor in which year? Year 21 after the Hijrah. So from 21 to the year 60. 60. That's almost Same. four decades that Muawiyah, Muawiyah was ruling the land of Sham. Sham. You can imagine what kind of people now you had in Sham when you have a ruler like Muawiyah leading them. Muawiyah comes from the clan of Banu Umayyah. Banu Umayyah were well known for their hatred towards the Prophet and Islam. He was the son of Abu Sufyan who launched so many wars against the Holy Prophet peace mm -hmm. be upon him. In Sham, Muawiyah was very manipulative. He was very shrewd, uh, politically savvy, to guard his own personal interests. What he did in Sham, he had no economic uh, system in place. Basically, all the wealth and resources of the government was dedicated to give a few influential people in Sham who would support the government of Muawiyah. So the average person in Sham actually wasn't receiving anything from Muawiyah. Mm -hmm. If there was any opposition, he would immediately quell the opposition. So Muawiyah invented this corrupt system of giving unlimited amounts of money to those who would flatter him, to those who would support him, and to those who would fight any opposition. So we see this situation in Sham. Muawiyah took advantage of this situation and he established his own media. People of Sham were ignorant. They had no clue, even who the Prophet was. What happened in the history of the Prophet? Who the Ahlul Bayt were? He had a strong uh, a system in place where there was censorship. People of Sham had no access to what, go, to what was really going on out in the Muslim world. Muawiyah had painted this image of Ahlul Bayt as rebellious people who did not represent the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, who did not pray, did not fast, had nothing to do with religion. That's why many people in Sham, they were shocked to hear that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, was struck in a masjid. Why did Ali pray? They did, not, they did not even know who Ali ibn Abi Talib was. After the Battle of Karbala, when Imam Zain al-Abidin along with the women and the prisoners, they arrived Sham, 
You had elderly people who you think would know who these people are. They verbally attacked Imam Zain al Abidin. You people, you are heretics. You are troublemakers and so on and so forth. When Imam Zain al Abidin asked that old man, he told him, have you read the Qur'an? He said, yes, and what do you have anything to do with the Qur'an? Mm. This is what Yazid and Muawiyah had done in, in Sham. He told him, haven't you read this verse in the Holy Qur'an which speaks about the family of the Prophet and uh, showing love and compassion to the family of the Prophet? He said, yes. He said, we are the family of the Prophet. He tells him, are you? You're the family of the Prophet. That's how brainwashed they were. And there's another incident which Muslim historians have narrated, a man goes to Sham. This is to demonstrate uh, uh, the very miserable situation of, of the people and their hatred towards Ahl bayt A man says, I visited Sham and I realized no one names their sons Hassan and Hussein. Hussein. No one. These are the grandsons of the Prophet, yet no one uh, uh, gives these names. He said, I visited one of my friends in Sham and I realized he had named his two sons Hassan and Hussein. He says, I was happy. The first family that I know in Sham who have named their sons Hassan and Hussein. So I asked him, I told him, MashaAllah, that's wonderful that you have named your sons after the name of the grandsons of the Prophet. He said, no, that's not why I named them. He said, then why did you name them? He says, because when I get angry and I want to yell at them and curse them, I named them Hassan and Hussein so I can curse Hassan and Hussein. Allahu Akbar. Can you imagine the situation of the people of Sham? That's how Muawiyah was ruling Sham all these 40 years. Therefore, it is not surprising that they celebrated the martyrdom of Imam al Hussein. They celebrated the martyrdom of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. As mentioned, uh, around the middle of Rajab in 60 AH, uh, Muawiyah dies. Um, and then Yazid takes power in which uh, he sends um, Walid ibn Utbah, if I'm correct, um, the, the governor, wali, the of, governor Medina. of Medina, a letter to summon um, Imam al Hussein as well as uh, others to give allegiance to, uh, to Imam al Hussein. Um, this was just a few days before Imam al Hussein departs uh, Medina. What was the response? Uh, even though the Imam, when first summoned to Walid, he knew why he was summoned. Muawiyah dies in the year 60, and before he died, he declared that Yazid would be the Khalifa to represent him. Many people knew who Yazid was. They were aware of his attitude, of his behavior, of his lack of faith. So Muawiyah, he did two things. Number one, he threatened his society. If no one, if and if you if you object, you don't like Yazid, then your other your other option is the sword. That's exactly what he said. Number two, he gave so much money to poets, to speakers in the Muslim world, to advocate for Yazid. So he was preparing the grounds so people can accept the caliphate of Yazid. When Muawiyah dies, the first thing Yazid does is he sends a letter to his governor in Medina. Al-Walid ibn Utbah, who comes from the Bani Umayyah. And his, his, his grandfathers were known for their uh, stance against the Holy oh, Prophet, prophets. their participation in the battles against the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. He tells his governor, don't announce the death of Muawiyah yet. The first thing you do is you get the allegiance from Hussein ibn Ali, then you announce it. Once we've secured Hussein's allegiance, no one will object. If Hussein has accepted, we'll accept. So he summons Al Imam Al Hussein. Al Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam, he goes with Bani Hashim, the youth of Bani Hashim, the men of Bani Hashim. He tells them to stand at the door. He tells them, if you hear me raise my voice or giving you a signal, signal then come and save me from, from, from this governor. But if you see me coming out, then you don't need to do anything. So the governor tells him, yes, Muawiyah has died. And Imam al Hussein alayhi salam says, Inna lillah wa inna ilihi raji'un, which is a general uh, phrase to say, To Allah we belong, to him and to him we shall return. The Imam didn't say anything more. He did not give any condolences. He men mentioned nothing about Muawiyah. He told him, Now Yazid has sent me a letter, and you have to give allegiance. 
Al Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam refused. He said, let's wait and see what happens from now till tomorrow. The Imam refused to give allegiance. Marwan told the governor, don't let him go. If Hussein leaves, you'll never get him again. Secure the bayan. But he was hesitant. He, he couldn't figure out a way to force Al Imam Al Hussein. So he lets him go. The Imam leaves, and that was his last night in the city of Medina. They told him, your brother Hassan made a peace treaty with Ma'awiyah. Ma Why don't you make a peace treaty with Yazid? Give him the allegiance or something like the allegiance. The Imam salam, says, Yazid is different. While they're both the same, they're both corrupt, but Muawiyah, at least in public, he appeared to be a proper man. Whereas Yazid publicly used to drink, drink alcohol. He was known to commit adultery, incest, all types of sins. Al Imam al Hussein said, Someone like me can <coughs> never pay allegiance to someone like Yazid. If I'm doing that, I am burying Islam alive. I can't do something like that. It's impossible. So the Imam السلام, decides that he would be forced to, be, to, to give the bay'ah, otherwise they would kill him. And the government of Medina told him that Yazid has not given you an alternative. He told me either to get the bay'ah from you or to send him your head. So the Imam realized that there was no point in staying in Medina because they would force him to give allegiance or they would kill him. So the Imam السلام, decides to leave the city of Medina. Thank you, Sayyid. Um, before I ask you why the Imam took his whole family, which I think is a, is a question that's repeated a lot, um, sometimes we, we don't answer the, the fact that why did he choose Mecca um, as, as the place to head towards? Uh, why not any other city? Um, knowing that he will be, you know, he's, he's, he's now under threat. Why did he choose the holy city of Mecca? The Imam السلام, chose to go to the city of Mecca for a number of reasons. Number one, Mecca was still the hub of the Muslim world. Mm. Uh, people from all over the Muslim world would come for Umrah, would come for Hajj to offer the pilgrimage. So this had given a great opportunity for Imam al Hussein to announce his revolution. And meet people. And meet people. When you have all these Muslims flocking to the city of Medina, that's a great platform for you to announce your mission, to expose Yazid and his injustice, to call the people for support, to meet all types of people, and that's exactly what happened. During the four months that Imam al Hussein السلام, stayed in Mecca, he met Muslims from all over the Muslim world. Uh, the Imam السلام, uh, arrived in, in, in Mecca early Sha'ban, and 4th of Sha'ban, the night of the 4th, which was a Thursday night, and he stayed there till the 8th of the Hijjah. So you have about four months in which the Imam was in Mecca. Number two, there was some level of freedom in Mecca. The uh, uh, governor who was uh, appointed in Mecca was not known for his uh, public hatred for Ahl al-Bayt. He wasn't very firm uh, against uh, uh, the opposition towards Yazid and Muawiyah. And in fact, at that time, uh, you had also Ibn Zubayr who was in Mecca and he wanted to assume the leadership, the leadership after, of, yes. after Muawiyah. So Mecca politically was chaos. It was not under the control of Yazid. So Imam al Hussein found this freedom in Mecca where he could preach, where there wasn't a governor who was f uh, uh, threatening to kill him. So these are a number of reasons why the Imam Ali Salam chose specifically to stay in Mecca uh, before heading towards Iraq. Um, as you mentioned in Rajab, late Rajab, he took his family. Um, and here we notice that he took everyone, including the women and the children. Um, um, the question that mostly arises is why is he, knowing that his life is under threat, taking his family and putting them under threat as well? The dearest thing to a, a father, a man, is his family, especially the kids and the women. Why would the Imam put them in such danger knowing that there is danger looming ahead. The Prophet, peace be upon him, when during the famous event of Mubahala, who did he take with him? His family. When he wanted to have a debate with the Christians of Najran, mm -hmm. 
He took Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, Hassan and Hussein, who were kids, and Lady Fatima. That's it. Why? The leader of the Christians had told his people, if you see Muhammad with his companions, have the debate and let's proceed. But if you see Muhammad with his family, don't dare have the debate with him because this man is truthful. When you leave with your family, it demonstrates to you your sincerity. It's not because I want to gain anything politically. It's not because I want to achieve power or wealth. Because if that's your goal, you would never endanger your family. And Charles Dickens, by the way, has a beautiful point here in which he refers to the family of an Imam al Hussein. He says, if Hussein rose to power to achieve a, a political status, why did he take the women and children with him? It stands, therefore, these are his exact words, it stands, therefore, that Hussein sacrificed purely for Islam. So even Charles Dickens has realized this point why Imam Hussein took his family. When the people saw Hussein with his family, they realized this is serious. Imam al Hussein is sacrificing his own family for the religion of Islam. The second reason why he took the women with him, because Imam al Hussein knew all the men would be killed, Imam al Abidin would be ill. Who is the one who would spread the message? Lady Zainab and the women and children. Who would tell the world what happened in Karbala? So the Imam السلام, was actually taking the media with him by taking the women and children. Uh, th this was to complete the mission of Imam al-Hussein because Imam al-Hussein would die on the day of Ashura. But how would his message survive? Through these women and children. And that's truly amazing. It, it, it demonstrates to you the master plan and the intellect of al Imam Abi Abdullah al-Hussein. Thank you very much, Sayyidina. Um, we are actually end of um, coming to the end of the first part, inshallah. In the second part, we will look at um, the letters that Imam received uh, from Kufa because, uh, as we know, the, these letters came only when he was in Mecca. Uh, so a lot of people, sometimes they suggest that the Imam left Medina while receiving the letters. That's not the case. The Imam actually made his decision before any letters had come to, to leave Medina. And it was only in Mecca that he received these letters. And inshallah, we will... Uh, continue our look at the journey of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam towards Karbala. We'll see you in a short while. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to 14 Divine Guides. We are looking at the journey of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam towards the holy city of Karbala. This is the second part. We are joined by His Eminence Sayyid Muhammad Baqar al Ghazwini. Just before the break, we reached that Imam al Hussein um, leaves Medina uh, at the end of Rajab and um, comes into Mecca. Uh, on the night of the 4th of Sha'ban, which is a Thursday night, uh, as historians tell us. And there he meets, uh, as Sayyid Muhammad Baqar mentioned, he meets a lot of uh, Muslim figures uh, who are there either to perform Umrah or getting ready for the Hajj season. Uh, he has a, lot, a few sermons, he has a few meetings, and uh, his revolution begins uh, to spread around the Muslim world. Um, and the people of Kufa start uh, sending their letters to Imam al Hussein. Uh, we have numbers reaching more than 10,000 letters or signatures uh, inviting Imam al Hussein to Kufa. Um, he knows, obviously, Imam al Hussein, as we mentioned in the previous episode, that his stepbrother Muhammad ibn al Hanafi mentions to him that you know the people of Kufa, uh, what they did with your father. He knows the type of people that are in Kufa, yet Imam al Hussein makes the decision to uh, send an ambassador and uh, to make the journey towards, obviously, uh, Kufa. Um, what are the reasons for this? And Imam al Hussein السلام, leaves the city of Medina as soon as Yazid is appointed as the Caliph. Before the people of Kufa actually send him letters, because the Imam left within days after the death of Muawiyah. So the people of Kufa hadn't even realized that Imam al-Hussein had left Medina. 
when the Imam السلام, reached Mecca, on the one hand, Imam al Hussein realized that the people of Kufa generally resisted Yazid. Most of them had not given allegiance yet to Yazid. So that was one encouraging sign. On the other hand, the people of Kufa now had heard Hussein ibn Ali has left Medina. So they realized something was going on. Imam al Hussein is serious about refusing to give any allegiance to Yazid. In the city of Kufa, in the house of a, na of a man by the name of Sulaiman al Khuza'i, the heads of the Kufans gathered. And they decided, let's write letters to Al Hussein ibn Ali. Let's invite him to come. Who can lead us better than uh, Imam Al Hussein? We've seen what Bani Umayyah had done. Now, Muawiyah, throughout his rule, he really caused the people of Iraq to suffer. He placed economic sanctions on them because some of them well, loved sure. Ali ibn Abi Talib. Remember, the capital of Imam Ali was in Kufa. Kufa. So they did not want another member of Bani Umayyah ruling them. They really favored an Imam al-Hussein to rule them. And they loved an Imam al-Hussein, many of them. They realized this is the grandson of the Holy Prophet. So once they gather in that house, Sulaiman, he tells his people, if you're serious, write him letters. Don't write him letters and then betray him. Mm. They say, no, we have no intention of betraying him. We'll stay firm. So the letters start pouring and pouring towards Mecca to an Imam al-Hussein. Nearly 14,000 letters and signatures reach Al Imam al Hussein. Now, Imam al Hussein السلام, really had no option but to go to Kufa. Why? Even though he knew they would betray them, he knew very well. Everyone knew people of, of, of Iraq. His father, Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was the Khalifa, was betrayed. Why would anyone think that now they wouldn't betray Al Imam al Hussein? But in the letter, you know what they were writing to Al Imam al Hussein? They were telling him, oh Hussein, if you don't come and Bani Umayyah you, ru you rule us, it's your fault. They placed the entire burden on him. Had Al Imam Al Hussein Al -Islam, not gone to Kufa, everyone would have blamed him. And even on the Day of Judgment, they would say, oh God, we invited him, he never came. It's your fault. It's not our fault. Mm. So Al Imam Al Hussein Al -Islam, to establish the hujjah and the proof, so no one has an excuse, had no choice but to go to Kufa. So the Imam writes them a letter to the people of Kufa. I have received your letters. May God bless you for your good intentions in supporting me. However, before I come, I shall send you my ambassador, Muslim Ibn Aqil, the cousin of Imam al Hussein. I will send him. If he tells me to come and you are firm in your allegiance to me, then I will come. The Imam السلام, sends Muslim Ibn Aqil to Kufa. Day number one, 18,000 people show up and give him allegiance. Muslim Ibn Aqid is excited. 18,000 the first day, he immediately writes a letter to who? An oh, Imam Hussein. Hussein. Hussein, come, run. People are waiting for you here. They love you. Now what happens is the, the spies of Bani Umayyah send, send word to Yazid of what's going on. What's going on? The ruler of Kufa, Nu'man Ibn Bashir. It's weak. This man was not only weak, he personally disliked Yazid. So he gave some freedom to Muslim Ibn Aqil. Immediately, Yazid sends word to who? Ibn Ziyad, who was the governor of Basra to the south. Ibn Ziyad was known for his ruthlessness, uh, uh, for his hard heart, for his lack of faith, for his cruelty. Immediately before Imam al Hussein reaching Kufa, immediately he goes to Kufa, Ibn Ziyad. He goes into the castle and he begins to rule Kufa. The people really loved that Imam al Hussein, but the problem of the Kufans was that they were not willing to sacrifice. They thought Imam al Hussein is going to come on a red carpet and everything's easy, he will govern us. They weren't willing to fight, resist, to sacrifice. He begins to threaten. Ibn Ziyad makes a speech, if I hear anyone supporting Muslim Ibn Aqil or Hussein, I will demolish your homes. And they knew he was serious because he had done similar things in Basra. I would even imprison you. And he started to give money to those who opposed Ahl al-Bayt. Within a day or two, he quelled the entire opposition. Muslim Ibn Aqil, that night when he prayed in the masjid, he looked back, no one was with him. No one was with him. 
Now, during this time, the Imam السلام, was now planning to go towards Kufa because the letter had come from yes. Muslim ibn Aqid saying, Oh, Ali, oh Hussein, they come, are we are waiting for you. Thank you very much. So yes. this is what happened with the people of Kufa. Initially, they really wanted to support the Imam. Once they saw it serious, Ibn Ziyad is demolishing their homes, willing to kill them, they abandoned that Imam al-Hussein. Yes, and this is all in the space of, of one, two, three months so we, we look at. Um, from history, um, Muslim ibn Aqil reached around mid-Ramadan. Uh, so after that, you know, after Shawwal, uh, the Al-Qa'da and Al-Hijjah is, is when he was um, killed uh, on the 9th of the Al-Hijjah, you know, just um, three months after he got there. Um, we noticed that Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him, makes firm decisions when when deciding to leave or Medina, for example, and even when he decided to leave um, the holy city of Mecca. Uh, he leaves on the 8th of the Al-Hijjah, um, one day um, before uh, the day of Arafah, um, the question is, why did he not wait and perform Hajj? Um, the Imam is an infallible Imam. Um, he knows Hajj is here, so you know if he's there on the night, it becomes wajib. Why does he decide to leave and make such a um, strong and firm decision to leave one day before the Hajj season? The eighth of the Hajj is a significant day. It's called Yom al tarwiyah which is the day when pilgrims gather water and prepare to go out to the desert to camp in Arafat. Imam al Hussein salam chooses that specific day to leave. When all Muslims are coming to Mecca, Imam al Hussein is leaving Mecca. Why does he do that? What was the reason that the Imam left on such a date? Number one, al Imam al Hussein salam knew that the Bani Umayyah were after him. They had arrived in the outskirts of Mecca. And Yazid had told them, kill Hussein, even if you see him holding on to the robes of the Kaaba in Masjid al-Haram, Allahu Akbar. So Imam al Hussein did not want his blood to be shed in such a sacred place like Masjid al-Haram. So the Imam knew they were after him. Had the Imam stayed one day longer, he could have been captured. So the Imam wanted to leave Mecca in order to avoid this situation. Secondly, Al Imam al Hussein was sending a powerful message to the Muslim Ummah. It's as if the Imam was telling them, Why have you come to perform the Hajj? What's the point of a Hajj when you have allowed a ruler like Yazid to rule you? What's the point? The Hajj is what? Is one of the symbols of Islam. When you have a ruler, who's destroying Islam, what's the point of doing Hajj? What's the point of praying? What's the point of fasting? So the Imam abruptly chose that date in order to shock the Muslims. That was the only way to shock them because they were in a deep sleep. So what if Yazid comes? The Imam says, I'll choose a date so that everyone talks about my uh, leaving uh, from Mecca. So this was actually a very intelligent way for the Imam alayhi salam to awaken the Muslim Ummah. What's, what's the point of these worship, worships that you're offering to Allah when Allah is angry with you for not standing up for justice, for not opposing someone like Yazid ibn Muawiyah? Um, we see the Imam's journey begins on this day um, and we see a lot of um, meetings on the way. Uh, one which I can remember is that of maybe Zuhair ibn al-Qayn or other times the Imam stops when he sees uh, uh, a group of people. Whenever there's a group of people, he usually stops and, uh, uh, as, as they say, gives them proof or the hujjah on, on, on them to join him. Um, he meets al farazdaq for example, in the way. A lot of these um, meetings we see during the journey of Imam al-Hussein. If we can pick out a few of these meetings, maybe the Imam... Um, does during uh, the journey towards Karbala, whether it's that of Zuhair ibn al-Qayn, because every step the Imam takes uh, and everything he does is, is a hujja upon the people around him and is a lesson for us to, to uh, a lesson he gives us to show the importance of his journey towards Karbala. The journey of Imam al Hussein al-Islam from Mecca to Karbala was truly an interesting journey full of events and important incidents. 
As soon as the Imam leaves Mecca, he reaches this place called Tan'im, which is an area where most people uh, come to do the Umrah. They take uh, their the ihram, they put on their ihram so they can enter Mecca. When the Imam reaches Tan'im, he sees a caravan full of goods and camels uh, being transported to Sham for Yazid. So the Imam السلام, speaks to them. What are you doing taking this to who? To an evil ruler like Yazid? The Imam tries to give them advice and some of them are influenced by the words of the Imam. So they decide not to continue their journey uh, in supporting Yazid. The Imam السلام, there he rents camels from them. He tells them, come with me and I'll give you your rent. Because the Imam realized there was a long journey ahead of him and he did not have the necessary equipment or modes of transportation to go to Karbala. So he rents the camels in Tan'im. After Tan'im, the Imam starts heading north, east, towards Iraq. He reaches uh, a village, an area by the name of Safah. Now at this point, everything apparently was going well. The Muslim of Aqil was now in Kufa. He hadn't got the news even he though He hadn't Muslim. gotten the news that Muslim has now uh, been killed because Muslim had been killed as soon as the Imam mm -hmm. left Mecca. Of course, the Imam receives divine knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the Imams of Ahlul Bayt are required to act upon the apparent uh, 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 events, not to always use their divine knowledge and, and speak it publicly. So now everything was smooth until the Imam reaches a village by the name of Sifah. Who does he meet? the famous poet, Al-Farazdaq, who has that beautiful poem about Imam Zain al-Abidin. Al-Farazdaq was a very famous Arab poet. He had just returned from Iraq. The Imam asks him, tell me Farazdaq, what's going on in Iraq? He says a very powerful statement. He says, Hussein, their hearts is, are with you, but their swords are against you. This was the first indication to the companions of Imam al Hussein that the people of Iraq had betrayed. But the Imam السلام, kept continuing. Now the Imam realized something has happened to Ibn Aqil. The sword, their swords are against us. They are no longer willing to support us. The Imam السلام, continues marching towards Kufa until he reaches a village by the name of Zarwat. At that time, Zuhair ibn al-Qayn was also camping around that village. Zuhair ibn al-Qayn, he had Ottoman tendencies. He wasn't so good with Ahl al-Bayt. Uh, he was one of the followers of Uthman and Bani Umayyah. And interestingly, he heard that Imam al Hussein was in the vicinity, in the area. area. He tried to camp far to miss him. in order not to see Al Imam Al Hussein, to miss him and not to see him face to face because he knew the Imam would now ask him for support. He did not want to place himself in that position. But SubhanAllah, the work of Allah is that he couldn't go too far. He actually uh, uh, is forced to camp next to the camp of Al Imam Al Hussein. As he was having lunch or dinner with his companions, Al Imam Al Hussein sends one of his companions as a messenger to come to him. Oh Zuhair, this is Hussein ibn Ali wanting to see you. Come, he wants your support. The companions of Zuhair were shocked. What is this? Zuhair supporting Hussein? Impossible. Zuhair has a different background. Hussein is from the Ahlul Bayt and Zuhair wasn't so good with the Ahlul Bayt. Zuhair doesn't say anything. His wife, she comes and she tells him, shame on you Zuhair. Allahu Akbar. We need to remember the role of these great women. And how because of them, some of, the, of their husbands were guided. She tells him, Zuhair, the, the grandson of Muhammad, the only grandson is asking for your support and you're not willing to even see him? Shame on you, get up and see him. So he felt ashamed. He went and he met Imam al Hussein. He comes back running, excited, happy. My companions, I've decided I shall join Hussein ibn Ali. You'd like to come, you come. You don't want to come, I'll leave you. They were shocked. What happened to you? What did Hussein do to you? Now Zuhair has an interesting uh, story of why 
he quickly changed. Of course, God knows what Imam al Hussein said so, yeah. to him, but he has a story with Salman al Farisi. Zuhair says once during the time of Salman, they were on some journey where they stumbled upon a treasure and they became very happy. Salman told them, you're happy with your treasures? They said, we're very happy. He told them one day, if you hear the call of Sayyid Shabab Ahlul Jannah, the master of the youth of paradise, you should be happier with Hussein than with these treasures. These words resonated in the ears of Zuhair al -Hatin. He remembered those. So he knew very well that his mission was to support an Imam al-Hussein. So he joins the camp of Imam al-Hussein salam, and they continue on their march towards Kufa. Now when Imam al-Hussein reaches a land called Thalabiya, he hears the tragic news that oh, Muslim ibn Aqil has been killed. The Imam is very pained. His own messenger that he sent to them has now been killed where? In the midst of the city center of Kufa. The Imam realizes that the people of Kufa, there's no hope with them. They're not going to support. If they killed my own messenger, they will allow Bani Umayyah to kill me as well. Of course, uh, in that area, Imam al Hussein um, informed his companions and um, the family members. And we, from history, we understand that the first majlis uh, or mourning for Muslim ibn Aqil was held by Imam al Hussein alayhi salam for his cousin Muslim ibn Aqil. Um, who was killed by Ibn Ziyad and then thrown off the, the castle and then his body was dragged and I think that, uh, this was a sign his body being dragged was a sign for the people of Kufa to see that this man that is supporting Al Hussein this is what's happening to him if you want to face the same consequence then you will support Hussein so again Ibn Ziyad uh, was conniving uh, and he was very shrewd and very very strong in, in, in what he did uh, and that's why the people of Kufa um, betrayed Imam al Hussein. Inshallah, we have come to the end of the second part. Uh, inshallah, in the third part, uh, we will look at uh, Imam al Hussein's meeting with Al Hur just outside uh, Karbala. Um, and Imam al Hussein's then his camp is taken towards uh, Karbala and he reaches there on the second of Muharram. And inshallah, we'll look at a few events leading up to the day of Ashura. Uh, we will join you in a few moments. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back to 14 Divine Guides. We are in the final part looking at the journey of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam towards Karbala. Uh, if you've just joined us, we are joined by His Eminence Sayyid Muhammad Baqir al Qizwini. Um, we believe that Imam al Hussein meets Al Hur uh, ibn Yazid al Riyahi um, just outside um, Karbala. Uh, at the end of the Hajjah uh, and there's a conversation that takes place between Al-Hur and Imam al Hussein, and then the Imam is his way is sort of taken away from Kufa and towards uh, uh, Karbala. First question is what is the conversation that takes place between Al-Hur uh, and Imam al Hussein? and secondly why did the Imam um, go towards Karbala? So when the news of the death of Muslim bin Aqil reaches Al-Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, the Imam immediately informs his companions. Now, politically, or let's say from a military standpoint, that's not wise to tell your own people of a tragedy because you will lose your support. This is also an indicator of the honesty of Al-Imam al Hussein. He tells his companions, we've lost Muslim bin Aqil, the people of Kufa will betray us. If you'd like to leave, you can leave. I will not force any of you to stay with me. Now most of them end up staying with the Imam al Hussein alayhi On his way to Kufa, Ibn Ziyad had now sent al Hur with 1,000 soldiers to block the Imam from reaching Kufa. Even though Muslim ibn Aqil had been killed, 
Had Imam al Hussein reached Kufa, there was still hope that the Kufans would rise, topple Ibn Ziyad, yeah. and appoint the Imam as their leader. So the, in, the only goal right now at this point for Ibn Ziyad is to block the Imam from reaching Kufa. He sends Hur with 1,000 men. Hur was a powerful army commander. He intercepts the Imam السلام, right outside of Karbala, on the outskirts of Karbala. So the Imam Hur tells the Imam السلام, why have you come here? What do you want? The Imam السلام, said, the people of Kufa, you invited me. That's why I have come. Hur said, no, we did not invite you. The Imam told one of his companions, take out the letters. The Imam السلام, took out loads and loads, camel loads of letters, and he placed them in front of Hur. Oh, Hur, see, the people of Kufa invited me. That's why I've come. Hur said, well, I personally didn't send you a letter. At that point, the Imam السلام, tells him, okay, you don't like me to go to Kufa? I won't come to Kufa. I'll go back to Hijaz or where I came from. Hur said, no, we won't let you go anywhere. We will stop you here. Why does Hur stop him and not allow him to go? Because he was instructed by Ibn Ziyad that we are sending thousands of more soldiers to just get the job done and stop Hussein from reaching Kufa. At that point, Hur did not want to kill Imam al Hussein. He never had the intention of killing Imam al Hussein. He just wanted to block the Imam from reaching Kufa. He figured if I let Hussein go, maybe he gets more supporters on the way and he'll decide to come to Kufa. So he just keeps the Imam camping outside of Karbala in hopes of getting more and more soldiers from Ibn Ziyad to stop the Imam السلام. Now another thing that happens between an Imam al-Hussein and Hur is that the Imam السلام, when he realized Hur is not going to let him go back and uh, the Imam السلام, tells him, Thakalatka ummuk. May your mother grieve you, bereave you. Hur finds this as an insult. insult. I'm a commander of the army, and Hussein is saying this. And the Imam السلام, had every right to say this. He's blocking women and children, and the Imam from reaching Kufa. Some scholars say the reply of Hur could have played a significant role in his subsequent tawbah and repentance. He tells him, oh Hussein, what you have said is great upon me. However, I cannot say anything to you. How can I say anything about your mother when your mother is Fatima? He just kept quiet. He did not answer back the Imam السلام. And this could have been a reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided him to the tawbah. So Ibn uh, Al-Hurr ibn Yazid al riyah he stops the Imam from going to Kufa and he just forces him to camp outside of Karbala in hopes of getting more soldiers from Ibn Ziyad. Thank you, Sayyidina. And that's when they um, choose their campsite um, on the 2nd of Muharram uh, in Karbala. And just to prove the point about uh, Hur, um, I think when he does find out that they are going to fight, uh, when Umar ibn Sa'ad's army does come, he actually asks Umar ibn Sa'ad, are you, are you really going to fight al Hussein? Because he, he, he in no way, I think, thought that there was going to be war or fight. And that's when Umar ibn Sa'ad replies to him, yes, there will be hands cut and legs cut and uh, heads cut today. And that's when Hur decides uh, you know, to, to change his, his side. Um, Imam Hussein delivers many speeches. Uh, and he meets Umar ibn Sa'ad a few times. Um, a conversation takes place. Uh, and then even on the 7th of Muharram when, when, the, when the water is stopped, he, he gives a speech uh, to the other camp. Um, he's come all the way and even till the last minute he tries to call for peace. He's come all the way to start a revolution but it seems here he's doing speeches well, maybe to, to back out. Well, but obviously there's, there are reasons for these speeches. What, were, what, was being, what was the message behind these speeches and for what reason was the Imam making on the second day of Muharram, the Imam السلام, enters the land of Karbala and he asks about, about the name of this land. He's given several names when finally one of the companions tells the Imam that this is called Karbala. When the Imam 
hears the word Karbala. He has heard this phrase many times from his grandfather. The, the word Karbala in Arabic is a combination of two words, Karb and Bala, tragedy and distress. So the Imam tells his companions, this is where we shall settle. This is where our men shall be killed. This is where our women shall be taken as captives. So the Imam gave, he prepared them well for what was going to happen. Now before Umar ibn Sa'ad arrived, Zuhair ibn al-Qayn told that Imam al-Husayn, let's fight Hur and the thousand. We can overcome them. The Imam had warriors with them. Sahih, they were only 72. But the Imam السلام, had warriors with him. And Imam al Hussein السلام, refuses. He tells him, Zuhair, I've not come here to spill any, anyone's blood. I don't want to start this battle because everyone will blame me and say, well, Yazid didn't want to kill, kill Hussein. He started the battle. So the Imam did not attack Al Hur, even though had he attacked him, he may have achieved victory. Let's take a break, Sayyidah. <coughs> just like a bit of hot water. Maybe this water. Is this something that's always uh, infection oh, yeah. For that's why Let him get you some hot water, Sayyid. Can you give him a few minutes? Okay, Sayyid. Kamil? Fadl. When Umar ibn Sa'ad arrives in Karbala with thousands of soldiers, we have some narrations estimating the number of soldiers with Umar ibn Sa'ad at 30,000. The Imam السلام, gives a number of speeches to these people, trying to admonish them, giving them advice, explaining his position. But Umar ibn Sa'ad was determined to kill Imam al Hussein السلام. He knew the Imam would never give allegiance. The Imam السلام, requests to meet Umar ibn Sa'ad. When he meets Umar ibn Sa'ad, he tells him, do you not know that I am on the right path? That the truth is with me? He says, yes, I know that. The Imam tells him, then why? Have you sided with the evil ones? He comes up with a number of excuses. He tells him, oh Hussein, I'm afraid they will demolish my house if I don't. The Imam says, I'll build you a house. From my own money, I buy, I'll buy you a house. He says, but I'm afraid they'll take away my property and farmlands. In, in Iraq, the Imam tells him, I'll give you better farmlands and property in Hejaz from my own property. He refuses. The Imam kept on giving him offers, but he kept refusing. He says, I've been promised to be the governor of Ray. The Imam السلام, when he realized that Umar was determined to fight him and there was no way to convince him, the Imam actually did a prayer against him. He, told, he tells him, Oh Umar ibn Sa'ad, may Allah send someone to kill you on your deathbed. And Allah accepted this prayer from Imam al Hussein. Soon after Karbala, he was killed on his deathbed. Now you may wonder or ask, why is the Imam trying to avoid this battle? Hasn't he come for a revolution? Why is he trying to make peace during those final moments? This demonstrates that the mission of Imam al Hussein was not to spill any blood. He wanted to reform the society, to speak against injustice. But the Imam never wanted bloodshed. He never asked for bloodshed. The Imam wanted to avoid violence at any cost. But these people, due to their evil, evilness and treachery, were just determined to kill Al Imam al Hussein. Thank you, Sayyidna. Um, when looking at the history, we also. Um Notice that, of course, this journey of Imam al Hussein, um, again, just like our previous episodes, needs a lot of um, time for us to go through all the steps, and we are we are just looking at a glance of some of these steps um, because there is not enough time. So, inshallah, we are the viewers can maybe try and do the, their further reading into into the, the the journey of Imam al Hussein, and the many sermons that the Imam 
gave uh, from the second of Muharram, from the first time he met uh, Al Hur, uh, he actually uh, at, the, at prayer time, Hur's army pray behind the Imam, and the Imam gives a speech. Then there's speeches um, given on the, um, the night of Ashura to his companions, where he shows them uh, their position in in, in paradise. Uh, after testing them so many times um, and also there's quite a few sermons he gives on the day of Ashura uh, to to the enemy uh, where he walks uh, uh, towards the enemy holding uh, the Quran uh, and wearing the, the Holy Prophet's turban. Uh, again these speeches they're, they're quite long and I, our advice inshallah for the brothers and sisters to try and maybe read these uh, speeches that are available on the internet and some books. Uh, I'll also want to mention this important point that we mentioned that the people of Kufa betrayed the Imam um, by sending him letters and then not helping him. But we noticed that his prominent companions that were with the Imam were actually from Kufa. And it's only so it's important for us not to say all of the Kufans may be um, left the Imam. Of course, some were imprisoned, some were killed, and some actually, uh, example like even maybe Zuhair, uh, Muslim ibn Awsaja, uh, Habib ibn Madahar, even Hur, they were actually prominent people in the Kufan society. Uh, so not all the Kufans, I think, um, uh, fought against the Imam. Um, let's look at the night of Ashura. Um, and of course, we realize on, the, on Tasu'a, uh, the enemies got closer um, to the Imam, uh, as Imam al-Sadiq says, on, uh, when, when asked about uh, the, the ninth of Muharram, he says, this is when the sawad increased on my grandfather, the, the, the dark, it became dark on my grandfather when the enemy surrounded him from all sides. Imam al-Hussein What the Imam asked for one more night, as we mentioned in the previous episode, what took place on the night of Ashura? A number of important events occurred on the night of Ashura. The army of Umar bin Sa'ad had decided to actually start the war on the night of Ashura, so, not during the day. However, the Imam السلام, sent his brother, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, to request one more night. Abu al-Fadl did not tell them why. He just said, we want one more night. There was some dispute amongst them. And then one of them says, look, if these people were pagans, non-Muslims, we would have given them an extra night. Let alone if they are. Let Muslim. alone if they are the family of the Holy Prophet. Let's give them an extra night. And Imam al Hussein says, I want one extra night to offer a few more units of salah in such a dark night. For Allah knows how much I love salah. This was the goal of Imam al Hussein. He wasn't trying to evade war, running away from war. He wanted to spend one more night supplicating and preparing himself to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One important event that happened on the night of Ashura was that Shimr ibn Dhul Jawshan, he was a distant relative of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas through his mother Umm al -Bani. He came and he brought amnesty to Abu al-Fadl and his brothers. He called out their names, come, I give you am amnesty, leave Hussein and we'll spare you. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas became furious. He told him, may God curse you and your amnesty. You want me to join you and abandon the grandson of Rasulullah. On the night of Ashura, the Imam took the women and the children to Imam Zain al-Abidin who was extremely ill at this point. And the Imam appointed him as the Imam after him. So they would witness that Imam al Hussein is now transferring the Imam to his uh, son Zain al-Abidin. Now once the Imam realized that his companions were firm, he gave them an, a, a final opportunity to leave. He told them, now it's dark. I won't even see who's leaving. You don't need to feel ashamed. Whoever wants to leave, you can leave. Once the Imam realized that they were firm in their stance to support him, he thanked them, he congratulated them. And not only did he tell them they will be in paradise, but he even showed them their ranks in paradise. So these are some of the major events that occurred on the night of Ashura. In addition to the camp of Imam al-Hussein engaging that entire night in, 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 in praying, reciting the Holy Quran, whereas the camp of Yazid was partying, drinking, getting drunk. Of course, um, the Imam also met um, his uh, sister Zainab that night and also again told her 
I gave her some advice on uh, on on the next day, uh, and we hear of a special event where the Imam um, is speaking with Sayyida Zainab Salamullahi Alaiha in her tent, uh, where she asks him if he has uh, tested his companions, um, and one of the companions overhears this, and then he calls Habib and Muslim Ibn Awsajah and the other companions of Ibn Al Qain, where they come and um, show Sayyida Zainab that we will be loyal to your brother. Um, Imam Al Hussein alayhi uh, salam. We see a beautiful also pl um, where Abbas is uh, sharpening his sword and, and reading poetry, um, and where where everyone is is is, is doing uh, du'a and supplication and prayer. And Abu Fadl Abbas salam Allahi alayhi guarding the tents obviously on that night. Um, on the day of Ashura itself, uh, not to go so much into the tragedy of Imam Al Hussein. Uh, the patience of Imam Al Hussein again is another characteristic that uh, that 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 we see on this day because not only does he see all his companions befall in front of him and his his children and his six months old Abdullah Al Radi or Ali Azgar uh, Ali Al Akbar Al Qasim but then in uh, in the maqatil uh, in in, the, 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 in in history it tells us when he came out to fight. Uh, he fought like a courageous lion where uh, the description is, the, the translation, if I can say, is they would run away with, uh, run away from him as, as if sheep are running away from the wolf. Uh, so he would go to one side and they would run away. And we see this with a lot of the companions as well, where the enemies, the, 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 the companion or the, the, the person fighting from Imam Hussein's side would have to actually run after the enemy to fight them. In one case, Abbas throws away his sword just to tell him, you know, come and fight me. The patience of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam is, is outstanding. The fact that he's seen all this yet, he, he's always in dua and, and, and supplication and he, he is strong when he comes out to fight. I can make one statement about the patience of Imam al-Hussein. And it is the statement that his grandson, Imam al-Mahdi says about his grandfather Hussein in Ziyarat al nahiyah He said, لَقَدْ عَجِبَتْ مِنْ صَبْرِهِ مَلَائِكَةُ السَّمَا The angels of this guy who have witnessed what happened since the day Allah created Adam till that day. The Imam says, the angels of the sky were shocked at your patience. What more can I say? when the angels of the skies were shocked at the patience of an Imam al Hussein, One of the enemies says, never had I seen a man who has been surrounded, who has been injured, wounded, his mm. relatives killed, his own baby infant slaughtered in his arms, more patient than Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. In every stage of the battle, when he would fall to the ground, he would raise his head to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the sky and he would say, Ilahi ridhan biqallahik. Oh Allah, I've accepted this test. La ma'bud suwaak. Aghithni ya ghiyath al Truly the courage of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam is baffling. He inherited that courage from his father Ali ibn Abi Talib. When it came to defending his family, the woman, the family of the Holy Prophet, there was no man more courageous than Ali, than, than Al Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. But the Imam alayhi salam witnessed every type of tragedy on the day of Ashura, and that truly required substantial patience. Only God knows the patience of Al Imam Al Hussein. Thank you um, very much, Sayyidna. And of course, um, just uh, the last point to touch on the patience of Zainab, because however difficult it was for Imam Al Hussein to see everything. Um, I've heard a special reciter mention that um, Zainab's patience was greater and um, when uh, they asked him why, he said because um, Imam al-Hussein saw everything in front of him, his brothers, his, um, his sons, his children, his companions die, but he did not see himself obviously. He actually went, but Zainab saw everything that Imam Hussein saw plus seeing Imam al-Hussein himself. And uh, she held the flag for the message of Abi Abdullah al Hussein, and she as Umm al Musaib, but at the same time she is she is the woman that stood there in front of Yazid and gave the eloquent speech. She is that woman that carried her her brother's body and said, "Ya Allah, taqabbal minna hadha al Qurban." The patience of Zainab is what uh, 
made the message continue. If we can just in a f few minutes or a minute or two just summarize that patience of Sayyidah Zainab sallallahu alayhi wa The Arab poet says بِأَبِلَّتِي وَرِثَتْ مَصَائِبَ أُمِّهَا فَغَدَتْ تُقَابِلُهَا بِصَبْرِ أَبِيهَا He's referring to Zainab alayhi salam. I sacrifice my love, my life for the one who inherited the tragedies of her mother Fatima. But she was able to withstand them by the patience of her father Ali ibn Abi Talib. Imam al Hussein Ali salam on the night of Ashura had sensed Zainab was collapsing. So the Imam placed his hand on her chest and he recited a special dua. And he took a firm oath from her, Zainab, this mission depends on you after me. If you crumble, if you collapse, if you become impatient, the enemies will rejoice and they will achieve victory. So Zainab, Saint Zainab السلام, realized that the only way for the message of Imam al Hussein to continue and to achieve success was by her being patient. So despite the tragedies, as you have mentioned, she witnessed more than what Imam al Hussein witnessed. She witnessed what happened after the martyrdom of Imam al Hussein, the tents being set to fire, the orphans of Imam al Hussein being beaten. Whenever they would cry, Father, Father Hussein, instead of anyone comforting them, they would be beaten by spears, the back of the spears. So Zainab السلام, really is a mountain of patience, and it is through her patience that she was able to give success to the message of Imam al Hussein in Karbala, in Kufa, and in Sham in the presence of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Um, thank you very much, Sayyidina. Sadly, we have come to the end of this episode. Um, just as uh, per every episode or every infallible, we do mention a few books again. Um, a, a further book for, for everyone to read into in English because um, a lot of these works are either in Arabic or Persian uh, is the life of Imam al Hussein by Allama Baqir Sharif al Qarashi. Uh, Sayyidina, if you can mention uh, for further reading, brothers uh, and sisters watching at home, any books they could read on the life of Imam al Hussein. Alayhi salam. For those who uh, read Arabic, I recommend two very important books about the life of Imam al Hussein. Alayhi salam. One book is Al Hussein Min Al Mahdi Il Al Lahd, which is authored by the late Sayyid Muhammad Kazim Al Qazwini. It's a wonderful book. The translation of the title is Al Hussein from the Cradle to the Grave. Uh, it gives you a beautiful uh, uh, insight into the life of the Imam and all the events with great detail. Another book is called Alamul Hidayah, uh, which is authored by a group of researchers uh, in the holy city of Qom. It's 14 volumes, about the 14 infallibles. Uh, one of them is dedicated to Imam al Hussein salam. So I really urge those, uh, uh, if, if you know Arabic, read them. If you don't, have someone uh, read the book for you and uh, give you a brief overview of uh, the important highlights of the book, inshallah. Thank you very much, Sayyidna. Uh, we would like to thank Sayyid Muhammad Baqar al-Qazwini for his knowledge into the life of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. May Allah accept uh, this show and this, uh, this small glance at the look at uh, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And inshallah, may he intercede for you on the Day of Judgment and inshallah grant you his ziyarat. Uh, thank you again, brothers and sisters, for watching and inshallah we will see you in the next episode. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.